Richard back and actually I wasn't able to be here last week so I sort of feel as I'm welcoming you for the first time. Uh, for anyone who wasn't here last week and who isn't familiar with Holy Trinity, I think most of you are but the toilets are through the door at the side of the back there if you need them. Um, I spotted, and those of you who follow the um, church calendar will have spotted that on Tuesday we actually marked George Herbert's day. He was commemorated in the lectionary. Uh, and so when we said morning and evening prayer here, we used the collect for George Herbert. Uh, and I'm going to use that as our opening prayer this evening. And if you listen carefully, you might recognise some of the words and phrases that the collect has obviously lifted from his poetry and from some of the hymns that we still sing. So let us pray. King of glory, king of peace, who called your servant, George Herbert, from the pursuit of worldly honours to be a priest in the temple of his God and King. Grant us also the grace to offer ourselves with singleness of heart in humble obedience to your service. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. No? Yes, there we are. Not sufficiently switched on, that's been my problem all my life, really. <laughs> Lovely to be here with you again, and we're having a look this Lent at some different George Herbert poems every week, and it was great fun to be here with you last week, and I hope that we'll be able to have a look at the second one of those today. If you've got a, a glimpse of the leaflet that's around this one, it'll be quite helpful to make sure you've got one of those, but there'll be one or two breaks as we go through. Um, the same pattern as we had last week, but for those of you who weren't here, I did a bit of introduction. Then there's the opportunity to talk just in twos or threes, trying to keep those groups pretty small, really. First of all, about your kind of emotional reaction to the poem that we've got tonight. So try not to analyse it too much, just talk about how you feel having heard it. Then we'll have a bit of feedback on that and uh, I'll say a bit more and then a bit more opportunity for some discussion with one another but focusing particularly on maybe what uh, Bible passages, some of the images in this poem tonight particularly pick up for you. A bit of more feedback on that, then I'll waffle on for a little bit more and we'll finish off uh, ideally, certainly before nine o'clock tonight. So I hope that's okay. That's what we're going to try and do. So we're following through Lent with George Herbert, and I wonder how your Lent is going at the moment. In my experience, it's about this point, sometime around the second Sunday in Lent, that you start wobbling on those things that you've decided to give up or whatever. There are one or two smiles ruefully around the church when I say that. And uh, Friday is the day I usually have as a day off, and it had been quite a hard week last week um, in the parishes that I'm the rector of. Uh, we usually get something in the region of one funeral a month, and last week five came in, including um, my aunt, who was 103. She's my dad's eldest sister, He's a mere stripling of 92, <laughs> and uh, uh, a remarkable lady who I was very fond of. She was proud of the fact that she'd lived through two worldwide pandemics because she was born right at the end of the Spanish flu. And when they offered her a vaccine in the COVID pandemic, she refused to have it, not because she was a, a vaccine denier, but simply because she said, for goodness sake, give it to somebody who will use it for longer than I will. So. <laughs> Quite a character, really, and her, her funeral is next week. 
But all in all, it had been quite a hard week, and it was that point when, having given up alcohol for Lent, I really felt like having a glass of beer as I was cooking the dinner that night. I wonder if you know that feeling. And that moment when, sometime during Lent, you think, why am I doing this? Yes, it's just giving up some small things, isn't it? But what is it all about? What, why do we take on this kind of discipline? That's the kind of question that occurs to me from time to time. I don't know whether it occurs to you. Maybe it does. And the theme often is that Bible verse about take up your cross. If you're going to follow Jesus, he says, whoever's going to do it, let them take up their cross and follow me. Well, giving up alcohol for Lent is not a very heavy cross, is it? But most of us probably at different times in our lives have greater crosses to bear one way and another. And larger questions which are the same as those small questions or the questions about the small things. Why am I doing this? Why am I really following this particular code of life? Why do I believe what I've committed myself to? And what does it mean to take up your cross? You just get fed up with it all. And so if we can have the first slide, Phil, that would be great. Those same questions, I think, underlie the poem that we're going to look at tonight called The Collar. And I want to give a little bit of background to that before we actually hear the poem so that we get some sense of what the context is, so that we have some idea of where this poem is coming from. So George Herbert lived from 1593 to 1633. He was born in Wales when Shakespeare was about 30 years old, if you want to locate him, because I'm pretty sure this is the one church where you can be absolutely certain that people know roughly when Shakespeare was born and died. George Herbert was 10 when Queen Elizabeth I died, and he lived into the early years of Charles I's reign, and the first signs of the trouble that would lead in less than 10 years to the English Civil War. Though we think of him as a poet and a priest, in fact, he was only a priest for the last couple of years of his life, and he published no poems in his lifetime either in English. He did publish some Latin ones, but they had a slightly more rarefied audience, really. So there was a question at the end of his life, really, about what he'd actually achieved, I guess. He'd had many ups and downs in his life, and he struggled with the direction of that life. And that, I think, is what we see happening in today's poem. So tonight, there is a, a bit more history and biography than, there'll be, than there was last week or that there will be in future weeks as well. That's partly to get it out of the way, because I think it's important to have some sense of it in order to grasp George Herbert. The other sessions won't be the same, and that is a promise for you. Much is actually quite contested about George Herbert's life. There isn't very much evidence for most of it. We've got um, just a couple of handfuls of his letters, for example. Nothing else much about him apart from the poems. So there are ways of putting his life together that are different from mine. So take everything that I say with a pinch of salt. That's generally quite a good idea anyway. Trying to take a biographical approach to his poems, as some people do, is a bit suspect, I think, because we really don't know when these poems were written. There are only two manuscripts of the poems, one shorter than the other, and the short one is from 1626. The other one comes from around the time of his death, and the second one has some additional poems in it, so we can tell that those were written after 1626, or be reasonably confident that that's the case. But other than that break point at 1626, we have no real idea when they were written and what the context is. What we can say about the collar is that it is in that group of poems that seem to have been written after 1626. It's not in the first manuscript we've got that dates from before that. And as you'll see, I think that 1626 was part of a lost period of indecision and lack of direction for George Herbert that might have prompted this poem. 
So, the collar. Well, the first thing to notice about it really is the title. Herbert was quite unusual in his time in um, giving all his poems titles. By and large, people didn't do that. They were known by their first lines. But this seems to be a bit of a pun. At first sight, you think, well, obviously, uh, perhaps, you know, somebody who's known as a priest, it must be to do with dog collars, but that's not actually true because people didn't start wearing those until the 19th century. So it isn't really about whether he's called to be a priest or not, which is what some people tend to think. It's more to do with the idea of restraint. Queen Elizabeth talked about the fact that she put collars on all her nobles in order to make them obedient to what she wanted. It really seems to be about obedience and obedience to a master, really. But it could also relate, because spelling wasn't really standardised at the time, it could also relate to the old word for anger, which is collar as well, but spelt C-H-O-L-E-R, C-H-O-L-E-R. According to George Herbert's older brother, Edward, George Herbert made such an impression with his holy and exemplary life at Bemerton, where he was the rector, that, said Edward, he was little less than sainted in the area around Salisbury. But, he added, in a rather older brotherish way, he was not exempt from passion and choler, being infirmities to which all our race, he meant the Welsh, is subject. In other words, George Herbert was prone to the odd tantrum. Maybe that's what we're seeing in this poem as well. And then there's a, a third intriguing possibility here which is that uh, we think that people in the 17th century spoke with what we would now think of, probably, as a slightly American intonation. And so if you think about how you might say this phrase, the collar, in a kind of American accent, it might be to do with the caller, as we would now say. Can you hear that roughly in, in your head? So potentially, we've got actually three meanings punning on this word at the beginning, and that might be a bit of a clue to how to read it, really. And of course, the caller that it is probably talking about is right at the end of the poem. The last couple of lines, methought I heard one calling. So is this really about the voice of the one who is calling? George Herbert's poems are not all serene. In fact, he said that they were the result of his spiritual conflicts. And in that sense, they're particularly like the Psalms in being absolutely honest in their relationship with God. Herbert is frequently caught in his poems talking to God as if he's talking to another human being. And that's quite unusual for his time, in a way, because this seems to be um, a, a fairly relaxed relationship, really, and he's not worried from time to time at calling God out on things that he doesn't think are right or fair, and that's part of the background to this, too. The theme of this poem, really, is about doing things differently. It's about that moment when regrets step in. Why didn't I do that differently? Why didn't I make a different choice? Why didn't I go in a different direction? Why have I followed God's way and not just done what I want, wouldn't I have been happier if I'd done that? It's a poem about rebellion and claiming freedom. And when we think of it in those terms, it's helpful also to have a bit of an idea about Herbert's era. The, the modern world, in inverted commas, as opposed to the medieval world, both terms that weren't really used at the time, that world that Herbert inherited uh, that Herbert uh, occupied was an inheritor of what we call the Renaissance, also not a word that they used then. And when we think of it in those terms, it can easily imply a break with the medieval past that contemporaries wouldn't have recognised. But that idea does help us, with hindsight, to see that many things had changed in the late 15th and 16th centuries. And by George Herbert's time in the early 17th century, the trickle of change had gathered into a flood. And if we can have the next slide, lovely, thank you. Here's a painting from the National Gallery that you might recognise, painted by Hans Holbein in 1533, so 100 years or so uh, 
before George Herbert's time. It's called the Ambassadors and often used as a way in to some of the key changes that had happened in the 16th century. It's a picture of two French ambassadors to the court of Henry VIII, and particularly we can look at the objects that are on those shelves between them to get some sense of what some of the key themes were at the time. On the upper shelf there, you might be able to see, um, first of all, uh, a celestial globe, a, a kind of a model of the heavens. This is a time of uh, development, particularly of astronomy, telescopes being invented, Copernicus and Galileo giving a completely different picture of the universe. There are scientific instruments there as well that really show you exploring the natural world. And notice that uh, the surface that's there is a Turkish rug. It gives us an idea about the global reach of trade and the way in which dialogue with people who had a completely different faith was also a feature of the 16th and 17th centuries. And then if you look at the lower shelf there, you can see there a couple of books reminding us that printing had just come in, the first mass media, really, that existed. There are some musical instruments there, a terrestrial globe this time, with some navigational instruments as well, reminding us that Europe had just been uh, developed as an identity. It's marked on this globe there. And that meant there was an awareness of other cultures, of strange places, a whole new world across the Atlantic. And so all of these things represent the ideas of learning and things that were changing during that time. It's a creative and exciting era, but it was also one that could be frightening and could induce a sense of cultural vertigo. And this picture reflects that side of things as well. The musical instrument that's there, the largest one you can see on the bottom shelf, is a lute. If you can look at it very closely, and obviously you can't at the moment, you would see that one of the strings is broken. It's a symbol of discord. The hymn book that is open there, although these two chaps are both Roman Catholics, and uh, one of the reasons Holbein went to paint in England was because it was a good Catholic country, but actually the book that's open there, the music book, is a Lutheran hymn book. So it's pointing towards reform, pointing to the fact that there's a divided church. And all the questions that go with that fast forward to George Herbert's time, and it's still quite a big question, even for convinced Protestants, about what the status of the Roman Catholic Church is. George Herbert's grandfather was well known right through most of the Elizabethan era as somebody who was a recusant. In other words, he paid the fines not to go to church. That's a good way to raise funds, isn't it? Anyway, he paid fines not to go to church because he still reckoned that he held to the old faith. What did that mean about salvation for him? George Herbert and his brothers and sisters might have wondered. It leads to a, a level of anxiety and concern, really. And, of course, one of the other big things about the Reformation was that it encouraged a freedom of expression. It encouraged you, dangerously, to make up your own mind about faith. I mean, really, that's not on, is it? Or maybe it is. No. <laughs> we think it is, but it was a fresh idea in the 16th century and arguably is one of the key things that underlies all the turmoil of the 17th century as well. The other book that's on there is an arithmetic book, but it's a primer on arithmetic for merchants. So a reminder that besides great culture and ideas, this was an era when capitalism was born. Money, getting and spending and having enough was an ever-present issue for people. And the globes, the terrestrial globe, shows us images of Europe and points towards the New World. Colonies, particularly the colony of Virginia, was particularly important to George Herbert and his family. Colonies where there was a dream of setting up new communities, new communities which 
could live in a different way, in a Christian way. But of course, also for us, we think, hmm, but what was it doing to the people who were already there at the time? And all kinds of difficulties for them as well as these new people sailed across the sea with gunpowder and started enforcing their own settlements. And then the celestial globe, the way in which the old closed canopy of the heavens was opened up by the new discoveries of astronomy. And that leads to a kind of extraordinary terror of empty spaces. Can you imagine how it feels if the whole of the roof of the universe is lifted off and you suddenly are acquainted with the idea of space? Quite frightening and anxiety-making in lots of ways, I think. And these two ambassadors here were themselves involved in the attempts of the French king to keep Henry VIII in communion with Rome. Henry had actually secretly just married Anne Boleyn when this painting was painted and when the ambassadors arrived, so they were a little bit late for the whole thing. But it's a reminder that this comes at the beginnings of the Reformation, this picture, and by the time George Herbert was around, 100 years later or so, those divides that had happened with the Reformation had significantly widened, though not necessarily in a completely unhealable way. This painting kind of then references the court and politics and, of course, the compromises that are involved in that kind of thing. The ambassadors were also there to help Henry negotiate a treaty with the Ottoman Empire and with England and France in an attempt to uh, push back against the domination of the ruling Habsburg family across most of Europe. They were um, ruling Germany, Austria, the Netherlands, and Spain. So this is a painting also about the influence and power of geopolitics. And then there are two other objects here, last of all, as we look at this painting. One is one that you can't see, <laughs> because only by looking at the actual painting itself in the National Gallery, I think, are you likely to see it. So you'll have to take my word for it. But over on the far side of the painting, just poking out from behind the curtain, so uh, about half obscured, is in fact a crucifix. It's an enigmatic image, because it almost seems to be saying, is this a Christian context or not? Have these new objects, these wonderful curtains, reached the point where they're actually hiding or partly obscuring the Christian faith? And then the second object is this extraordinary thing that's at the bottom there, which you won't be able to work out what it is unless you already know. It's what's called an anamorphic image of a skull. And you have to stand with the original right next to it in the corner and look at it out of the side of your eye to see the way in which Holbein has drawn this skull in perspective and for it to come to life for you. It's a, a strange image that appears there, but as uh, one of the people writing about it says, it's a vanitas image. It's a chilling reminder that in the midst of all this wealth, power, and learning, death comes to us all. It's also, almost certainly, an example of the freedom of the artist, because it's extremely unlikely that the people who commissioned this painting asked Holbein to put a weird image at the bottom. He seems just to have done it. And that points to an idea of freedom of expression, the idea of the artist as an individual. Holbein is one of the first artists where we definitely know his name. This is a whole period running through from the 16th into the 17th century when the idea of individual freedom of expression, being able to determine your life and what you do, becomes important, really, for the first time. Well, George Herbert couldn't have known this painting. It went back to France with the ambassadors. Uh, it was not known about until the National Gallery bought it in 1890 and it came to London. But it's useful 
to point to some of the key themes that were going on in his lifetime. It makes a good background to his world, a world which 100 years later remained exciting and scary, that offered new freedoms but was also riven with anxiety. And in that sense, it's a period which might speak to our day as well, because I think we also struggle with that sense of the shock of new things, different ways of seeing things, um, encountering the kind of cultural change that we've gone through in the last 100, 150 years or so. So all those issues, I think, float around in the background of this poem. And Phil, if we could have the next slide, I realise I forgot to show you this. You would have been able to see the shelves much better if I'd remembered it, wouldn't you? So here's the poem, and let me encourage you perhaps not to read it, but just to listen to it as you hear me read it. The Collar. I struck the board and cried, no more, I will abroad. What, shall I ever sigh and pine? My lines and life are free, free as the road, loose as the wind, as large as store. Shall I be still in suit? Have I no harvest but a thorn to let me blood and not restore what I have lost with cordial fruit? Sure, there was wine before my sighs did dry it. There was corn before my tears did drown it. Is the year only lost to me? Have I no bays to crown it? No flowers, no garlands gay, all blasted, all wasted. Not so, my heart, but there is fruit, and thou hast hands. Recover all thy sigh-blown age on double pleasures. Leave thy cold dispute of what is fit and not. Forsake thy cage, thy rope of sands, which petty thoughts have made, and made to thee good cable, to enforce and draw and be thy law, while thou didst wink and wouldst not see. Away, take heed, I will abroad. Call in thy death's head there, tie up thy fears. He that forbears to suit and serve his need deserves his load. But as I raved and grew more fierce and wild at every word, methought I heard one calling, child. And I replied, my Lord. So, let's have five minutes or so for you just to think how you react to that. Let me encourage you to stick with how it felt hearing it rather than jumping into um, analysing it too quickly. And uh, just talk to one or two people around you about how it feels to hear that poem and, and uh, to look at it on the page. And you've got uh, five minutes for that. 
Perhaps, uh, perhaps we can hear some reactions then. Patrick's got the microphone today, so he'll wander around and thrust it under your nose if you've got something you'd like to say. How did, how did you feel about that poem then? Anybody want to say something for us? Here we are. I think all four of us sort of sense his frustration. You know, I'm fed up. I want to sort this out. I want to do something. I, you know, and then suddenly at the end, some a still small voice of calm, as we said, spoke into him, and he, mm. oh, all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we were very impressed because we said, or Sarah said, you read it very fast because mm. that's what it was. It was, mm. I, you know, I'm fed up. Let's. Yeah. So it was interesting. And, and do you know that feeling? Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we felt it was like a tantrum that uh, he was throwing. And he seemed, as he gets to the poem, he seems to wind himself up more and more with his own frustration, the word, word that you said. And the kind of, the structure of the poem kind of unravels as well with it. It becomes incoherent as it, as it, seems, as it goes along. Yes, um, I, I was encouraging you not to analyse it too much, but you might have, uh, and, and I, but I, so, um, uh, I'm, that's not a criticism, Les, at all. Um, but you might notice as you go through it that actually the rhymes seem all kind of haphazard uh, and all that kind of thing, and the numbers of syllables vary and all of that. In fact, some people have said this is kind of, you know, the sort of free verse that you don't see again till you get T.S. Eliot in the 20th century. But actually... To read it, it works. You know, the, it's really catches speech rhythms. And, and you might remember when we were looking at Love 3 last week, those who were here, that I was talking about the fact that a lot of these poems actually seem to be kind of like little mini-dramas. And, and this is another one of them, really. There we are. One more at the back. I was surprised you read it um, with such anger because to begin with, I think he's, you know, he's free and he can go abroad and he can do all these things. And it's not until he gets towards the end that he really does become angry. So um, I think you were a bit too powerful in your reading yes. to begin with. I, <laughs> Sorry to criticise. That, no, that, no, I don't see that as a criticism at all. And uh, as I mentioned last week, I quite like it when people disagree with me anyway, because it means that, that you're, you're thinking about it carefully, which is good. Um, yes, other readings are available. <laughs> <laughs> but he was, he, you know, he did have um, freedom, and, and yeah. you know, he was, I think he was enjoying himself a bit at, at times. Mm. And it was only afterwards that he thought there must be something more than this, and he got frustrated and angry. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. I just want to say that um, reading it, I think I know how he feels, mm -hmm. <laughs> quite honestly, because I think I've, I've been there or places pretty much like that, feeling, is there any point to, to it? Is it all just fantasy? Is it just yeah. made up? Is, you know, wouldn't I be better to just forget about religion and... Doesn't it just doesn't it just sort of shut my life down and prevent yeah. things? And yeah, and and I think one of the benefits of having a poem like this is that it gives expression to that, doesn't it? Um, and that's actually quite important. Really. Yeah. Anybody else? Oh, here we are. It's all just designed to make you run up and down the aisle, Patrick. I hope no one else has said this because I haven't been able to hear the last two, but I don't know if you can hear me. Um, the whole idea of restlessness is very much Herbert. And if we think of the pulley, God gives us restlessness so that we might, it might toss us to his breast, which it does in this poem. So I think that's another dimension which I always read into this. Yeah, thank you, yes. That theme of restlessness is very important um, for George Herbert. I, I think partly because uh, his life was really pretty restless. Yeah. 
And especially this kind of period that I'm talking about now, I mean, he, he has no fixed home at all. Um, and, and it's sometimes hard for us to grasp, I think, that in a society which has no version of the kind of welfare state, really, it was actually quite easy for quite, even quite well-to-do people to end up with nowhere fixed to live and so on. The very first house that he could call his own was the rectory at Bemerton in 1630. So at that point, you know, he's 37 years old. And so by the ways of the time, actually quite an old man by that point. And that's the first time he properly has somewhere that he can actually say uh, is his. So that kind of restlessness, I think, comes out of this poem and, and a number of the others as well, yeah. Time for one more, if anybody else is, is dying to say something. Here we are, Paul. Uh, by way of, of trying to draw together some of mm. the comments that we've heard, could I draw attention to just uh, a, a sort of a pivotal line, which is, comes right at the end and introduces the still small voice? But as I raved and grew more fierce and wild, I think really that's the feeling of the poem, isn't it? There is a crescendo, as Liz was saying, uh, fierce and wild, fierce against the restraints, whatever they are, of religion, morality, the straight path, the way of the cross, whatever we call that, and wild, that's to say more and more romantic, more and more self-assertive, um, and more and more ego-related. Yeah. So I think all those things are, uh, are perhaps present in our future and give us a bit of a launching pad, maybe. Yes, thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. good. Okay. Well, are you in the mood to hear about the Parliament of 1624? Well, no, I didn't hear a, a great enthusiastic <laughs> response. Let me see if I can make it interesting. Perhaps we could have the next slide, Phil, if that's possible. There we go. Um, ah, that's, uh, that's a young Charles I who shouldn't have appeared there. I've got my animations not quite in order, but don't worry about it. Um, let's go back a bit then in George Herbert's life. He was a precocious scholar as a young man, won a scholarship to Trinity College Cambridge at the age of 16, which is not quite as radical as it sounds because that was fairly normal in those days. And Cambridge then became his life for many years. And this is his college, Trinity College in Cambridge, as it was in 1575. They'd added a few bits by the time he got there, but not very many. He rose eventually to become the university orator in 1620. Today, the university orators are, are really pretty insignificant characters. They just happen to be able to speak good Latin. But back in the 17th century, this was a highly significant role. And not just at the university, but uh, nationally and to a certain extent internationally as well. Herbert had been pursuing this role for some time and it had led some of the past holders to high office at court. So it could easily be seen as the road towards quite an important role at the centre of the nation's affairs. He described it in a letter to his stepfather as the finest place in the university, for the orator writes all the university letters, makes all the orations or speeches, be it to king, prince, or whatever comes to the university. He takes place next to the doctors, is at all their assemblies and meetings, and sits above the proctors, is regent or non-regent at his pleasure, and such like gaynesses, which will please a young man well, he says. A condition of his college fellowship was that he should be ordained after seven years, which would have been in 1623. But the king, James I, who we'll see on the next slide popping up, I hope. There we go. The king, James I, was often at a place called Royston in North Ants, which is not so very far away from Cambridge, where the king kept a house. Um, James I's great passion was hunting, and it was good hunting country. Herbert seems to have been drawn into the orbit of the court after he came to the king's attention following an outrageously flattering speech to him when he visited Cambridge. So ordination was delayed 
there was a question. Might Herbert follow the other orators before him into court service? The rewards were great, but so were the opportunities, perhaps, to become a Christian statesman. And I think there's a question there for him about whether that might be the place to make his mark. It's not a choice, as perhaps we might think of, between secular work and church work. It's more, where did God want him to fulfill his vocation? Might it be in the church or might it be through the court and through parliament and so on? James I's reputation has been recently undergoing a bit of a revision. When James came to the English throne in 1603, he offered a fresh start in a Europe that had become bitterly divided on political and religious grounds. That Habsburg domination that we saw in the ambassador's painting had become entrenched and it had led England into war with Spain for decades before James came to the throne. Queen Elizabeth had had James's mother, Mary Queen of Scots, executed in what was really a judicial murder in 1587. But 16 years later, when James became King of England himself, remarkably enough, he did not seek revenge on the English courtiers who had been party to it. This was, in its own way, an extraordinary thing. And in fact, he understood it to be a notable Christian response. He was forgiving those who were his enemies. He saw himself as, and this was the phrase that he frequently used, Rex Pacificus, the peaceful king. And the motto he chose was, blessed are the peacemakers. Peace was his policy at home and abroad. It wasn't necessarily very popular, but it was heartfelt and deeply held. His first act as king, really, was to declare peace rather than war on Spain and bring that long-running war to an end. And at the same time as this, being able to use some of the resources which might otherwise go on warfare, they were directed towards expansion west across the Atlantic, as I talked about briefly before, to develop godly colonies in America, especially in Virginia, and that's a place where the wider Herbert family had significant investments in the company that ran it, and they saw that as some kind of Christian mission. The colonies offered new opportunities for Christian ways of living. But James's rough Scots ways and his accent, his frequent tendency to drink too much, and his enjoyment of the company of handsome young men all conspired to make English courtiers look down on him. But he was successful in keeping peace in England in a way that his son, Charles I, later failed to do. And he managed to do the same in Scotland, despite being absent from the kingdom, which was quite an achievement. He was possibly the most intelligent monarch ever to rule England. Widely learned, a prolific author of many books, which he did actually write himself, and more theologically literate than almost all of the bishops that he had. The authorised version, the King James Bible, is perhaps his greatest legacy, and that itself was an immense undertaking and organisation achieved in quite a short time. So drawn into the orbit of this king, George Herbert seems to have bought very strongly into the peace policy. But by 1620, when Herbert seems to have got involved in court things, it was under threat. What became known as the Thirty Years' War had broken out in 1618, and James was under pressure to provide money and troops to fight on the continent in defence of the Protestant cause, especially as the figurehead of that Protestant cause was his own son-in-law. Popular opinion in the country had swung strongly in favour of war, but James resisted. Many young men from England and Scotland crossed the Channel to fight in the Netherlands on the Protestant side, including two of George Herbert's own brothers. We have the next picture. It'll come up. There we are. This is the Duke of Buckingham, James's favourite and effectively his chief minister. Increasingly, Buckingham came to favour war. And he drew Charles, the Prince of Wales, who's there looking young, 
uh, under his influence. And in 1623, they nevertheless set off on a madcap adventure to woo the Infanta, the Princess of Spain, in Madrid. I cannot understand why nobody has yet made a film of this, because it would be a brilliant one. The Infanta was the daughter of the Spanish king who was proposing a dynastic marriage that would promote peace and perhaps also require the restoration of certain rights to the Roman Catholic Church in this country as well. So Buckingham and Charles rode under aliases to Dover to take ship for France. But Charles was still young and had not yet grown a beard, so he had a false one which fell off at an inn on the way, and he was recognised. You can see why I think it would make a great film. It gets better. In Madrid, by the time they got there, the king had changed his mind and didn't really want Charles there at all and certainly didn't want him to marry his daughter. So Buckingham and Charles were reduced to having to climb the walls of the garden where the Infanta used to go for her walk and peer over the top of the garden wall in order to get a look at her because they couldn't do it any other way. They remained in Madrid as effective prisoners for months, having failed completely in their objective. Complete failure. And when at last they escaped and made for home, expecting that they would have all kinds of ridicule when they arrived back, they got off the boat, to their surprise, to find bonfires and celebrations all across the kingdom which welcomed them as heroes. The reason being that there was now no prospect of peace with Spain and the pro-war party was clearly in the ascendant and despite their best endeavours, Charles and Buckingham suddenly had become the poster boys for this um, pro-war party. But amongst this clamour for war, there was one voice in particular that stood out against the rush to war. Charles went to Cambridge, and when he got there, while the town fated his accidental triumph, at the university, Mr Herbert, the orator, was awaiting him with a speech. That speech, in Latin of course, pulled no punches. Herbert praised the potential of the Spanish marriage for peace. He commended Charles for having pursued it. And then he spoke really passionately in favour of peace. Perhaps we can see the next slide, Phil. There we are. Here's part of what he said. In peace, sons bury their fathers. In war, fathers their sons. In peace, the sick are made whole. In war, even the whole perish. In peace, there is safety in the fields. In war, not even within walls. In peace, the song of the birds awakens us. In war, trumpets and drums. Peace has opened a new world, he means America. War destroys the old. Know you not, I pray, the miseries of war. They're powerful words even now in translation, aren't they? And even if those words were spoken on behalf of the university, they still seem personal to me. George had in fact lost his two soldier brothers already in the war. One, Richard, only a few months before fighting in the Netherlands. Well, soon after this speech, a parliament was called, which is the second image that you can see up there. And Herbert put himself forward for the first time to become an MP. He was elected largely because of family influence, but nevertheless, it was an important step if he was looking to develop a career at the court and in politics. And the 1624 Parliament was dominated by two things, the move to war and also the future of the Virginia Company in which the Herbert family were deeply involved. Herbert resisted the first of these, the move to war, and he strongly supported the second, the Virginia Company. And he failed in both. Because the king caved in to the call to war, leaving over 20 years' pursuit of peace in ruins. Parliament voted to pay for and send troops to the continent, although in fact the intervention never actually happened. And the Virginia Company was wound up amid unfounded accusations of financial malpractice, 
which were widely believed. Well, most politicians then and now, most ambitious young men, would have trimmed and adapted to the new reality, but not Herbert. That's why I think he'd perhaps been pursuing a dream of Christian statesmanship and serving God amidst the mess and compromise of political and court life. But it was not to be. He left Parliament at the end of the session and sought ordination as a deacon. Let's have the next slide and see it. There we are. We don't know precisely when that ordination happened, but it was most likely at Advent 1624 and may well have been in Lincoln Cathedral, as you can see it here. As a deacon, he could not serve in Parliament, so this was an end to his court hopes. But nor could he have an effective ecclesiastical career until he was ordained peace, priest. But for the best part of five years, he simply wandered from place to place, something apparently of a lost soul. His mother died in 1627, and at some point in these years, he seems also to have been very ill with what was probably the tuberculosis that would eventually lead to his death in 1633. Only in 1629, when he married, and 1630, when he both moved to Bemerton as rector and was finally priested, did he re-enter the mainstream of life. Well, that's enough, perhaps you might say too much, biography and history for today. What I've tried to do is to give some context to this poem, The Collar, because it seems to me to express the pent-up emotion of those years. Had his life been all blasted, all wasted, he must have wondered. So perhaps we can see the next slide, Phil, back to the poem itself. Thanks. George Herbert described his poems, you might remember, as showing his spiritual conflicts. And this one, it's not only that he could have been free, but that his faith, doing the right thing, being a good boy, has fed anxiety in him. There was wine before his sighs dried it, he says. So let's abandon ourselves to double pleasures without fear of death. Call in thy death's head there, he says. The full gamut of temptations. I want to be free, not subject to anyone else's rules, anyone's servant, including God's. But he says, as I raved, God's voice calls him back. So where do we think God is in this poem? Clearly there in the last lines, but are there other elements of this poem that suggest certain Bible passages to you or images that are used that connect you up with something or other else that you remember in the Bible? There are no right or wrong answers here, and please don't worry if something comes to your mind that doesn't quite seem to fit with the overall theme of the poem. I want you to kind of free associate a bit, if you would. Just have a look at the text and see what you think and see what comes up. So again, um, five minutes or so just to have a chat with uh, one or two people around you and just see what you can come up with. And then we'll share those briefly together before we draw to a close later on. Okay.
just one more minute to go. Well, let's see. Um, Patrick, can we get you to get some more steps in? <laughs> I can see. It's good. It's good. So what came out of that? Um, anything you'd like to share with us? Just, as I say, no right or wrong answers. It's just fascinating to see what reading that poem might have prompted in, in terms of Bible images or stories or whatever. Anthony's got one. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, well, if you want um, one possible parallel from Scripture to a great deal of this, isn't it the story of Jonah? Yeah. Who, uh, who yeah. Is, is restless, runs away from his call, then he, eventually he goes back and he does what he's told to do, and then he's dissatisfied the, with the result and gets into another tantrum. Yes. And then at the end, God calms him down again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lovely. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. And in the same vein, uh, the Psalms and Job. Um, the Psalms, because there's a permanent quarrel with God. Look, my enemies are all around me. Look, I'm in a terrible state. Uh, what are you doing about it? Um, and then in Job, of course, there's this frustration, this rebellion. Uh, and at the end, God speaks, you know, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world and so mm -hmm. on. So those, uh, there are two further uh, potential scriptural thoughts. Yeah. Well, not a literal connection, but an emotional connection with the mention of thorn and blood led me to the crown of thorns. But that's then to be juxtaposed a little later when he refers to, I have no bays to crown it, laurels mm. on his head. Um, so those are two images that kind of came to me. I was yeah, and, and actually it's slightly puzzling, isn't it, in a way, that you're suddenly getting that image of the crown of thorns in the middle of this tantrum. Hmm. We, we will go a little bit deeper into that later on, yeah. Mm. seems to me there's a real sense of failure that what he's tried to do in his life just hasn't worked, hasn't, yeah. and, and he wants to chuck it all and, and, and go off and enjoy himself, maybe, yeah. or liberate himself from it. And, and any, did anybody pick up on that with a particular biblical passage or anything? Liz, behind you, I think, has. James, if you don't mind just passing that through. It was one that was referred to last week, the prodigal son, um, yeah. the idea of you know, double pleasures, he said, I'm going to go and waste everything. I'm just going to go and enjoy myself. Yes, yeah. The prodigal son seems to be hovering behind this one as well, doesn't it? As, as it was last week too, yeah. Yeah, anybody else? The, the idea of arguing with God made me think of Moses leading his people across and you know how they continually doubt and moan and and then God makes himself known or yeah. takes care of yeah. 
everything, but then, but then they, they lose their patience again and come back. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. When you start thinking about it, actually you realize that there are, there's a lot of arguing with God, actually, that goes on in the Bible, isn't there? Which is something that I think we probably don't emphasize enough, really. That the opportunity to do that is there. God is big and capacious enough to take all of that. And that, in some ways, is, is one of the key things in this poem, I think. Yeah. And anybody else got anything to, to add? I, I wonder if you picked up on the last couple of verses about um, the child and my Lord and thought of any passages that might connect with those as well. Any, any ideas? Yeah, that's one over here. Is it Samuel? Well, I think um, God calls upon Samuel as child, doesn't he? Yeah. Uh, right. You remember that story about the child Samuel, the boy Samuel in the temple? Yeah. And, and there's the, the, the voice calling, and he doesn't know who it is. So it's a lovely little story, that one. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, that's certainly there. And uh, also St. Paul. When I was a yeah. child, I thought as a child and right. so on, um, yeah. spoke as a child. Yeah. Good. The juices are flowing now. This is good. <laughs> and Jesus said, you must become like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven. Yes. Which, for me, rounds the poem quite perfectly. Yes. Become a child again. Going to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must become like a little child. Um, there's something of that going on here, isn't there, too? Yeah. I, I, have I got a wire loose? Not, not a screw, a wire. Yeah. <laughs> Apologies for, for the interference. We're not sure what it is. It's a gremlin okay. in the system, but I don't think it's you, It's not Richard. me. No, no. okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well... Lovely. Thank you for those. I hope that's kind of just stimulated things a bit to see what some of the connections might be here. Um, some of the other ones that had just occurred to me, particularly to do with the, the last couple of verses there. Do you remember, a, it's a slightly obscure story, but a lovely one, in 2 Kings chapter 5, which is where uh, Naaman the leper, who's a, a general of the Syrian army, suffers from this uh, lep leprosy, a, a skin disease. And it's a, a little girl who's been captured as a slave from Israel who says that he should go and wash in the water. Uh, and at first, he, oh, what ridiculous, you know, we've, we've got much better rivers, thank you very much, in Syria. But of course, she goes, uh, she, eventually, he takes her advice. He goes there, and uh, uh, Elisha, I think, is with him there, and he comes up out of the water, and uh, I think it's probably just the authorised version that says his skin was as that of a little child. Which, uh, again, seems to me, you know, here's, here's the grand general, but submitting to that means that he comes out of it, as it were, reborn in a sort of a way. Um, if you think of the story of Jairus' daughter in the Gospels, what Jesus says is, little child, get up, Talitha Kumi. It's that voice again. And um, Mark chapter 10, yes, uh, unless you become as a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. God's relationship with George Herbert and with us is first of all of a parent and child, not master and servant. And in a sense, that's the pushback against the tantrum that's there. That this service, this collar that he is wearing, in fact, is not something that's demanded, but it's something that he's free to give if he wants to. If you think of Jesus in the temptations, then the question there is, if you are the Son of God, you can do this. It questions what his relationship is with the Father. But actually, recognising that he's God's child gives him the confidence to withstand the temptations. It's not something that he's defensive about and needs to prove, because he knows, of course, deep down, that it's true. 
and he's able to relax in that. So all that's nice and neat and tidy and good for a sermon, and I could just send you on your way with that um, pleasant sort of, uh, but not very profound spiritual thoughts. But I wonder if there's more going on in this poem. Let me take you back for a moment or two to that picture, the ambassadors, so there it is. And you remember what we said about the uh, skull at the bottom here. Uh, By the wonders of computer trickery, of course, they can do things with it, and in fact, if Phil presses the button, there you can see what it would look like if you really were standing next to it and, and, you know, twisting your eyes around it. It's like one of those horrible, do you know those hidden picture things? I don't know about you, I can never see them. And I do sometimes wonder if they're just a bit of a joke on you. But my children insist they can see them, so it must be right, mustn't it? But it's the same kind of thing going on here. But this is a fascinating thing, because to see it, you have to stand at the side, use your peripheral vision. And when you do that, it changes the perspective on the whole painting completely. Everything else pretty much fades away when you concentrate on the skull. You don't see all those other things. You don't see these important guys standing there. You don't see all those elements of great learning and uh, ways of understanding the world there. All you see is the skull. It brings about a complete re-evaluation of the significance of all those objects it questions the importance of the two ambassadors. In other words, looking carefully to find this skull means that you question everything. And if we can go back to the poem, Phil, there we are. Some of the commentators think that something similar happens with this poem. Because when you look at the text and when you see all those things that are mentioned there, a lot of them have double meanings. And we were picking that up just now. It talks about wine and corn. Well, you're used to those in church terms, aren't you? It's the Eucharist, bread and wine. It talks about thorns, as you pointed out. Well, when we hear thorns, we think crown. Is that what's going on here or not? Once you start looking, you begin to realise that there is, in fact, a completely different perspective that you could have on this poem. So far, we've assumed that, or I've assumed anyway, you might not have done, that Herbert speaks all the way through this poem until the final two lines. And the way you've got the punctuation in the one in front of you has got quotation marks there to help us to see that. But in the 17th century, punctuation was notoriously unreliable and random. And of course, there were originally no quotation marks in this poem as it was published. We don't actually know who the speaker is at any one time. And to earth that a bit, so you can see what I'm going on about, let's get very, very detailed and have a look and see what if the comma at the end of the third to last line, so after at every word, is moved to the end of the previous line. As I raved and grew more fierce and wild, comma, At every word, methought I heard one calling child, and I replied, my Lord. Because then it would mean that the caller is calling at every word of the preceding poem, not just at the end. Can you see what I'm getting at there? And once you start looking to see So is the caller calling at every word? That's when, a bit like the skull appearing, you begin to see double meanings almost everywhere. What if 
there's a new voice at the beginning of line three. So it's Herbert saying, I struck the board and cried no more, I will abroad, what shall I ever sigh and pine? And then there's an answer. My lines and life are free. Free as the road. Spelling was all over the place in the 17th century, but the way that George Herbert wrote the word road here was in fact R-O-D-E. And that's also the way that you can spell the word rude, which of course is an ancient English word for cross. There could be a pun here on the idea of a road and on the idea of a rude at the same time. It might be talking about the cross there. And then, stay with me, <clears throat> next line, loose as the wind. Well, wind, where do we pick that up? In the Bible, John chapter 3. The wind blows where it wills, where it listeth, I think the authorised version says. It's a picture of the Holy Spirit. Shall I be still in suit? Well, you can say that angrily, as I did earlier on. Shall I be still in suit, or shall I be still in suit? Not moving, stillness going on there. Being still in asking for something. Thorns we've already talked about. And perhaps those lines are in fact ironic ones. Have I no harvest but a thorn to let me blood? and not restore what I have lost with cordial fruit? Can you see how that might begin to sound like the voice of the caller, actually, rather than George Herbert? Is there no harvest? Come on, have a look at it, George. There has been a harvest here, hasn't there? And the sighs and tears, well, they might be Christ's. In Romans chapter 8, you might remember that St. Paul talks about how the whole creation groans and how the Holy Spirit prays through us in sighs too deep for words. Maybe we've got a reference to that there as well. Double pleasures, well, it might be the prodigal son, let's go for it, or it might be double pleasures, that is, on earth and in heaven as well. <clears throat> Those wonderful lines about the cage there, um, forsake thy cage, thy rope of sands, well, that might be the way in which uh, Herbert's life has been constrained by being a good Christian, or it might be God's voice speaking back to him and saying, actually, you've made this prison for yourself. I'm asking you and inviting you, but I'm not putting you in a cage. It's you who's made the rope of sands, and you can walk free from it if you want to. <coughs> and then, while thou didst wink and wouldst not see, that kind of takes me a bit back to the skull again, because it's about seeing rightly. Look at your life through a different perspective. What seems all blasted and all wasted might actually, in the extraordinary economy of God, be something that has helped to grow the kingdom of heaven. That those struggles, apparently failures for peace, might bear fruit in another way under God. The implication is that God was there all the time. That even in the wasted years, even in the failure, somehow the purpose of God might have been working. God was there calling at every word. And if we see it that way, I think it's an extraordinary shift, isn't it? But it seems to me that both these perspectives are true. It just depends where you're looking from. And in that sense, I think we begin to get something that is deeper than just the surface meaning of this poem, great as that surface meaning is, there might be something a little bit deeper here. Uh, I have to say to you that uh, I think it's quite hard to pursue this idea of, of the double message uh, 
completely and totally in this poem, so um, don't ask me to do it absolutely. Uh, and I think in a little bit of defence of George Herbert, this might be because he perhaps never managed to finish this poem to his own satisfaction to do that. Remember that he died before he was 40, and uh, it looks to me as if most of these poems have had very long gestations. Although they appear simple on the surface, once you dig into them, as we've found, there's an extraordinary chain of scriptural references, an extraordinary number of puns that make you think within them. And it may be that it's a project that never quite reached completion. I don't know. Um, some of you might know that there's a, a lovely book of um, commentary on Shakespeare's sonnets by Don Patterson, a book that I rather like and found very freeing when I opened it up one day to look at one particular one. And the commentary just starts off, frankly, Shakespeare had off days. This is one of his worst. <laughs> And with George Herbert, it's probably quite important because he emphasises his humanity in these poems to realise it ain't necessarily perfect, but there's enough suggestion there to make you think, hmm, maybe the caller was actually there at every word, not just at the point at the end of the tantrum, really. And when you think of those words at the end, the last two words, my Lord... Think where you hear those in the New Testament, in the Gospels. It's Mary Magdalene in the garden, and it's Thomas in the upper room. Both who don't recognise Jesus at first, and then trust that he's there. So that almost takes us to the end, really. Knowing that you're loved by God is the basis of real freedom, I think, in this poem. That doesn't change whichever way you look at the meaning of it. In later life at Bemerton, Herbert would always speak, says uh, Isaac Walton, his biographer, of Jesus, my master. And that seems to have been something he deliberately adopted towards the end of his life, to emphasise who he served i.e. not the king, not the Earl of Pembroke just up the road who owned the estates, but Jesus, my master. He had given his allegiance to him. It wasn't commanded, but of his own free will, he gave it. And the phrase, of course, whose service is perfect freedom, is one he would have been very familiar with from the Order for Morning Prayer in the Book of Common Prayer. The second collect for, for peace, interestingly enough. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom. It's a good phrase, isn't it? And I think that one lies underneath this. But we won't get into working out what resonance is with the Book of Common Prayer you can find in George Herbert's poems tonight. That idea, whose service is perfect freedom, comes again from George Herbert's favourite theologian that we mentioned last week, which was Augustine of Hippo. So let's finish tonight, shall we, with a prayer of St Augustine before I read through to you this poem once more. Lord, you are the light of the minds who know you, the life of the souls who love you, and the strength of the souls who serve you. Help us to know you that we may truly love you, so to love you that we may fully serve you, whose service is perfect freedom, through Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs> and here's an alternative reading of the collar. I struck the board and cried, no more I will abroad. What, shall I ever sigh and pine? My lines and life are free. Free as the road, loose as the wind, as large as store. Shall I be still in suit? Have I no harvest but a thorn to let me blood, and not restore what I have lost with cordial fruit? Sure there was wine before my sighs did dry it, 
There was corn before my tears did drown it. <coughs> Is the year only lost to me? Have I no bays to crown it, no flowers, no garlands gay, all blasted, all wasted? Not so, my heart, for there is fruit, and thou hast hands. Recover all thy sigh-blown age on double pleasures. Leave thy cold dispute of what is fit and not. Forsake thy cage, thy rope of sands, which petty thoughts have made, and made to thee good cable to enforce and draw and be thy law, while thou didst wink and wouldst not see. Away, take heed. I will abroad, call in thy death's head there, tie up thy fears. He that forbears to suit and serve his need deserves his load. But as I raved and grew more fierce and wild at every word, methought I heard one calling, child. And I replied, my Lord. See you next week, I hope.